Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program. If you just want to put your name in the chat and where you're from, we'll get started in a little bit. We'll just let people join. Just give it a few more seconds. Drop your name in the chat and where you're watching from. All right, well, we're gonna get started. Um, welcome to Sharks and Rays 101. Uh, my name is Erin Moran and I'm the public programs intern for UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. Um, as an organization, we conduct research, education and outreach for healthy coastal ecosystems and communities. Today, our marine educators will be teaching us about the importance of local shark and ray species and even show us some skates in the UGA Aquarium. Just a few Zoom tips before we get started. Uh, it's a webinar, so your video and microphone are off, but please feel free to ask questions at any time in the chat box or the Q&A box. You can type questions uh, in the Q&A box and we'll answer your questions as we go and there'll be time at the end too. Uh, the toolbar located on the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your device, it, device is where you'll find the Q&A and chat box. I'll keep track of those questions and we'll get to them as soon as we can. And with that being said, turn it over to Kayla. Good afternoon. It's uh, nice to have you all virtually here. Uh, so as Erin said, my name is Kayla and I am uh, one of the educators here at the UJ Marine Education Center and Aquarium. So we are on Skidaway Island, which is right near Savannah. Um, and Devin is here as well as are all of our live animals that you'll be seeing. Um, in addition to being the public programs coordinator for Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant, I also am a graduate student with Miami University of Ohio. Um, so you'll see on our next slide, uh, that as part of my master's studies, I'll be evaluating this uh, public program um, and hopefully writing a publication on it. Um, so I may use some of the responses from the chat box, the Q&A box, and Zoom polls that happen during the public program for my research. Um, all of the responses will be shared anonymously, so don't worry if you're, you know, your name is, is next to the chat. Uh, however, if you do want to make your post anonymous when you write it, um, you can do so by going to the Q&A box, and when you go to, to type your questions, you can select Ask Anonymously. Um, for mixed age groups, uh, please have the adult in the group type the questions and chat comments. Um, and if you have any questions at all about this research or you feel you need more information, you can contact my student email at clarkka8 at miamiohio.edu. If you have any questions or concerns about the rights of research subjects, you may contact the reviewing body, Research Ethics and Integrity Office at Miami University. And their contact information is there, and I'll also email it out after the program. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started talking about sharks and rays that live in the ocean. And so Erin's going to start a poll, and I'm curious, how many of you have ever been to the ocean? Yes or no? And if you say yes, go ahead and in the chat box, let us know um, where, where on the ocean or where near the ocean you've been. Wonderful, it looks like we're getting a lot of responses in. Uh, go ahead, you've got five more seconds if you haven't gotten your vote in. Uh, wonderful, so we will go ahead and end the poll and share results. That's amazing, so 100% of you have been to the ocean. And Erin, did anyone add in the chat box uh, which part of the ocean they've been to? Yeah, a lot of people um, went to both the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean and some in the Oregon coast. Also, okay. someone also was in Kenya. Oh, that's awesome. So a really wide mix. Um, and what's really cool is, so today we're gonna be talking about uh, the Atlantic Ocean Basin and sharks and rays that you might find in this section of our world. Uh, but basically there's just one giant ocean on the world with lots of different ocean basins. So things that happen in our little section of the ocean here connect to water all around the world. And even if you don't live anywhere near the ocean, uh, the ocean still impacts our weather and climate and is a major driver of that even really far inland. So even if you're you know, tuning in from Kansas, the ocean still impacts you and you impact it. Um, but as I said, we're gonna, as you'll see on the next slide, 
be talking mostly about the southeastern coast of the United States um, and specifically the South Atlantic Bight. Um, so the, the two white stars, the top one is at Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, and the bottom one is at Cape Canaveral, Florida. And all of that water in between is, is where we'll be talking about. Um, and a lot of that has extensive salt marshes and estuary systems. And Georgia is that yellow star right in the middle. Um, so that's, that's where Devin and I are talking to you from today. Um, so now that we've talked about where we're focusing on, let's talk about what we're focusing on. Um, so thinking about sharks and rays, and we're also going to see some skates. What do you all think? Are all of those organisms fish? Yes or no? And once you've answered yes or no, or I don't know in the poll, um, let us know in the chat what you already know about these organisms. Um, so it sounds like you already have a lot of experience with the ocean. Wonderful. We'll leave it open for just like 10 more seconds. Great. Well, I think we've got just about um, everyone voting. So we can go ahead and end the poll and share results. Awesome. So it looks like a mix of answers, but most people said yes. Um, and you are absolutely correct. All of those are fishes. So we're going to see on the next slide some of the characteristics that help us know that all of them are fishes. Um, so they're all aquatic, so they all live in the water. They all have fins to move with. Um, they all have gills to breathe with, and they're all vertebrates. So if you feel in the middle of your back, uh, they have a backbone just like us, so we're vertebrates as well. Um, our skeleton is made out of bone, as are all of the fish that you see on this slide. So these are all fish with really different body types, a lionfish, seahorse, flounder, but they're all bony fish. Um, and you'll see on the next slide that elasmobranchs are a really unique group of fish and that they have a cartilaginous skeleton. So basically, instead of a bony skeleton, they have cartilage. So if you like wrinkle your nose, pull on your ear, those are parts of our body that have cartilage. Um, in addition, if you think about a bony fish, if you've ever been fishing and you've caught, caught a, a bony fish, they have something called an operculum, and it basically looks like a half circle that's over the side of their bodies that covers their gills and protects them. On sharks and rays and other elasmobranchs, you can actually see the gill slits externally on the body. And typically, they'll have at least five gill slits um, on them. And depending upon what kind of elasmobranch it is, where those gill slits are might differ. So we'll look at that on some of our live animals. Um, but globally, there's approximately a thousand or so species of elasmobranchs. And unfortunately, a quarter of all of those species are in danger of going extinct. So they are a taxonomic group that really deserves a lot of uh, special attention and conservation effort. Um, and there's also a lot of variety within them. So I'm curious, uh, there's obviously a lot of diversity around the world, but off the Georgia coast, Aaron's gonna launch a poll. How much elasmobranch diversity, so how many species do you think there are off the Georgia coast? More than five species, more than 10, more than 15, or more than 20? Awesome. It looks like we've got about half of the folks voting. Perfect. We'll leave it open for just 10 more seconds. I actually didn't know this. I found it out from Devin while we were putting this class together and was pretty amazed. Awesome. So we're going to go ahead and end polling and share results. Yes. So um, those of you that said more than 20 are correct. And so that includes both shark and ray and skate species. Um, but a lot of variety. And we'll see just a few of those live. And then Devin will talk about a much wider uh, group of them when he's talking about his research. Um, wonderful. So the first uh, live organism that you're going to see is actually a pre-recorded video. So Aaron's going to play a video of a guitar fish. Um, and if you have pencil and paper on hand and you want to sketch what you're seeing, uh, that's a great way to kind of focus your observations. Um, and you can either jot on your paper uh, some of those observations you're making about this animal, or you can let us know in the chat. So note some of the patterns, the shape, behavior. Um, anyone know what species this is? Or have any questions about it or observations? So 
I don't know if you can see when, oh, look at that. So when it swims by, do you see how it's got those two clear patches? That part of its body is called the rostrum and it, it sort of sticks out in front of the, the mouth and they'll actually use that part of their body to hold their prey in place. Um, awesome. So it seems like someone said that it, there's a mix of skate and shark or ray and shark characteristics. That's a really good observation. So the front part of the body is sort of flattened, looks sort of like a pancake, um, similar to a, a skate or a ray. And the back part of the body looks maybe a little more shark-like. Um, so really cool fish. Any other questions or observations, Erin? Um, not any questions at the moment. So if anyone has any, just throw them in the chat. Okay, wonderful. And Devin, is there anything else that you would want to add about this particular um, organism? Because Devin is, is one of our curators here at the aquarium, so he knows many of these individual animals quite well. Yes, thanks, Kayla. And so um, if we're not going to let folks res uh, continue responding, I'll just go ahead and give away the answer that this is an Atlantic, Atlantic guitar shark. Um, guitar fish. So um, it's a really cool species. We caught this individual on our RV savanna during a trawl collection and it's an, actually an adult female guitar fish and so a pretty much maximum size for this species and um, found off our coast. Uh, one of the cool things that I liked when it swam by is that you could really see um, a hole right behind its eyeball that is called a spiracle and Kayla's going to tell us a little bit more about what that is in a little bit. It's a very functional tool for this kind of elasmobranch. But I, I think that was a great observation that was uh, put in the chat that it looks like kind of a mix. It's halfway between a shark and a ray. Um, but these particular uh, guitar fish, they like to eat small fish and shrimp. And like Kayla said, they can use their rostrum to sort of pounce on top of their prey um, and prevent it from escaping. Hey, Devin, would you like to answer a question just about uh, what the size of this guitar fish is and the length? So this guitar fish is right at 30 inches long. And that really is pretty much maximum size for this species, uh, you know, that's found along our coast. Sometimes it's, it is a little hard to tell the um, sizes through the viewing window, but. Um, and does this fish sit on the bottom? Yes, it does. It is able to sit on the bottom. It's actually able to burrow into the sediment as well. And um, has a very functional tool to be able to um, continue breathing while it's sort of buried under sand. Wonderful. Erin, are there any other questions or observations before we move on to our live stingray? I think we're ready for the live stingray. Okay, wonderful. So Erin's going to um, read and share a poll while I transition my camera. Um, and so this is a picture of a stingray that uh, was caught on our RV bulldog, which is our research vessel out of our Brunswick station. But I'll let Erin take the next poll away. All right, so the question is, all rays have a venomous barb or a stinger, true or false, or I don't know. We'll give you a few seconds to get your answers in. Lots of answers are coming in, but I'll give you five more seconds. And Erin, in the meantime, would you be able to spotlight my video? Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm going to end you. this poll. Yeah, so the majority of everyone said false, which is correct. And on this next slide, uh, we have some examples of uh, stingrays without a venomous barb. So these are two of our marine educators holding two uh, butterfly fish. So these are an example that don't have a venomous barb on them. So then with that being said, I'm going to stop sharing. and we're going to check out what Kayla has to show us. 
wonderful. Um, so anyone know what this organism is? If you do, you can put it in the chat box and Erin will let me know. Or if you don't know what species it is, um, you can also write observations about the color, the shape, behavior. <laughs> the grouper is coming to say hello. Might we hog have the camera. A few guesses. Um, someone said an Atlantic stingray. Another person said a southern ray. Yes, so both great uh, guesses, both uh, species that we do find in Georgia. Uh, this one is an Atlantic stingray. Um, it's really well adapted to uh, living on the bottom. Um, you can see that it camouflages well with sandy bottoms. And, you know, Erin did the poll about uh, venomous barbs and not all rays have them. Atlantic stingrays do, but their first defense mechanism is going to be to try and swim away from you. So if you're visiting the beach, the best thing to do is the stingray shuffle. So as you're entering the water, just to shuffle your feet and that'll cue the fish to, to get out of your way. Um, any other questions or observations? Uh, someone asked, does the barb shoot out or do you physically have to touch it to be stung? Great question. Um, you have to physically physically touch it. And it's a little hard to see because this animal is far away, but it's not at the very end of the tail. It's actually about halfway up the tail. Um, so we'll show a video in the PowerPoint later on of how to handle a stingray. So you can kind of control the tail if you do catch one when you're fishing um, and not, not get stung. Look at how they move. I just think that they're beautiful when they swim. So they actually, they're pectoral fins, which if we look at our grouper here, these ones on the side are the pectoral fins. Um, but on stingray, those fins have kind of modified to be more disc shaped um, and they, they move them in a sort of undulating pattern um, to, to move. And it might be a little far to see, but do you all see right behind the eye? It looks like a hole, but it's moving, kind of opening and closing. That is called a spiracle. And that's what Devin was talking about that acts like a snorkel. So basically because they're, they're bottom dwelling, but they have gills to breathe with that just pumps water over their gills and make sure they can still get oxygen out of the water, even when they're, they're buried down in the sand. Um, and so you can see that it's moving along the bottom, potentially looking for food. They don't have uh, teeth in the way that we think of shark's teeth. Uh, typically they kind of have a crushing plate, um, which they use for eating things like bivalves. So things like clams or other crunchy things along the bottom, other invertebrates. Um, they also can create these pits underwater. Um, so in terms of their ecological importance, they're really important food for other shark species like bull sharks and hammerheads. Uh, but they also can create these pits. Cormorants will actually dive down and take advantage of some of the invertebrates that get uh, shaken up out of the sediment when they're feeding. So pretty important in the food web. Uh, people can eat them too. This is actually one of those species that if you're fishing, you can keep and eat, um, at least here in Georgia. Um, they are fairly common. So that's something when we talk about different elasmobranch species, some are, um, have life histories where they reproduce more often and it takes them less long to get to maturity. Whereas species that are really long lived, that take a long time to, to develop to maturity or that only have a few young are much more sensitive to overfishing. So things like the scalloped hammerhead, you know, that's a critically endangered elasmobranch uh, that we do get, get in our area. Um, any other observations or questions? Kayla, someone asked, what happens if you do get stung? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so th their venom, if you put hot water, not scalding, but fairly hot water, um, that'll help break down the venom um, and help make you feel better. And then if you're, if you're having a strong reaction to it, typically it's not um, life-threatening for the, the stingrays that we have in this area. Uh, but if, if it's not getting better, then seeking medical attention is a good idea as well. Um, but like on our trawling vessel, we keep a hot water pot, kind of like you would make tea with um, on a, you know, a hot plate um, in the case that someone, like one of our crew gets stung. Good question. I think I saw um, it, it popped up that someone said that they've seen them in shallow tidal creeks um, and they will. They can come up pretty, pretty shallow water. They typically will move with the tide. So 
um, at high tide, they're probably going to be up in those smaller creeks. And then at low tide, they might move out into those uh, channels, the bigger channels. Well, I think for time, we're going to go ahead and keep moving unless there's any other uh, questions or cool observations. Hey, Kayla, can you stop right there and, and focus on that stingray? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Sorry, I noticed that the other uh, lighter colored one was um, doing this sort of behavior where it was staying put in place, but lifting the front of its snout up somewhat up and down and then it would continue um, roving across, roving across the bottom of the tank, um, just like that one is doing right now. And so, one really cool thing about um, sharks and rays is that they have electrosensory pits on the underside of their um, snouts or faces, called amp ampullae of Lorenzini. And with those pits, they can detect minute electrical fields which is a sort of a, a sixth sense that they have in order to look for pre look for prey and forage. So that's that is so cool. Common behavior that we see, or it's nice to be able to see that in happening in real time. Thanks. Thanks, Devin. Anything else about these before we move on? All right, we're gonna transition to clear nose skate now. Um, and we do have a mama skate in this tank. She's really well camouflaged, so we might not immediately see her. So we'll move on just cause I think she is pretty well camouflaged today. Um, but we'll go check out and see actually one of her offspring. So this is a, a skate that hatched out, um, I believe in the fall. And they are also, they were swimming around so much earlier today, but they are doing what they do really well, which is camouflaging along the bottom. Um, there is one here under the, the sand. I don't know if you can see it's, it's end of its tail sticking up there. But a little difficult to see at the moment. So I'm going to head behind the scenes and show you uh, some of their, their very small uh, clear nose skates. While I'm doing that, Erin, will you share our next poll about reproduction? Yep, so for this poll, it's another true or false, all elasmobranchs lay eggs. So you have true, false, or I don't know. So we are heading behind the scenes. Yep. So we'll give you a few more seconds just to get your answers in if you haven't already. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Uh, we had a mixture of answers, Kayla, but uh, mostly everyone said false. Yes, that is correct. So some do lay eggs. So we're actually looking at the egg of a clear nose skate right now. Um, and the mama skate actually, she just laid this on Friday. So it's brand new. You can just see the embryo, that dark patch right there. Um, but there's lots of elasmobranchs that give live birth or um, variations on that. So stingrays, for instance, will give a kind of a live birth. The ones we were just looking at don't have a placenta. So they just have like a giant yolk that's like 10 times the size of them. Um, they actually absorb that before they're, they're born, so they have all that extra energy. Um, but the clear nose skates will lay usually two eggs at a time. They lay them really frequently. So on average, a clear nose skate could lay as many as 30 pairs of eggs over a year. Um, the one that we have at, at the aquarium at one point over the summer was every four days or so she was laying, laying eggs. 
Um, so if we're thinking about management plans and which elasmobranchs you might be able to keep when you're fishing and which ones you have to throw back, um, a lot of that has to do with that reproductive strategy. So, you know, clear nose skates reproduce much more frequently uh, than something like a hammerhead or some of those, those other sharks. Um, and we'll see if this one is a little more active, but in this tank, we have one escape that hatched out and is still behind the scenes. Anyone sees it, let me know. Oh, there it is. So well camouflaged. Do you all see just the eye and that part that's moving is that spherical that we were talking about. So it's pumping water down over its gills, even though its whole body is covered with sand, except for that, that front part there. And we'll see if we can get it in focus. Their pupils are cool. Got some interesting shapes on it. So very cool, buried skate, well camouflaged. Um, doing what it does best. This one you might be able to see a little bit better swimming around. So there's a dark one and a light one. And Devin, how old are these skates? So those particular skates hatched in June of 2020. And okay. from October of 2019 to July of 2020, our um, mating adults or the mama skate laid 42 pairs of skate eggs. Wow, that's amazing. Anything else, Devin, that you would add about the skates before we head out back in front? Well, I think one amazing thing to point out that you, hopefully everyone can see pretty clearly is that there is some color variation that occurs um, amongst offspring. Um, I guess you could call these two siblings um, because they have the same mother or father, but uh, you can see a a striking difference in the coloration between those two, which is really neat. They will all typically have what's known as counter shading, where the top of the body is a little bit darker or more patterned than the underside of their body, which is just typically bare and white. And um, to show you some of the, you know, variety in colors and um, some more of the siblings, uh, as Devin was saying, as I walk back out uh, in front of the scenes, Aaron's going to share some videos of some egg cases and some skates from this summer. So the first video you'll see um, as she pulls it up is going to be um, egg case egg um, eggs. But notice how the one on the right hand side you can actually see some movement in it. So the one on the left is kind of like the one we just saw, and that it's mostly an embryo that you're seeing. Uh, but that one on the right, as it zooms in, you can actually start to see the body of that little baby skate. Um, and you can see some tail movement there. Um, as Devin was saying, they can pick up on electrical signals. Um, and even when they're in the, the egg, they can actually detect those electrical signals. And um, they will stop their tail movement if predators are nearby. So as some protection against um, getting eaten in the egg, which is pretty incredible. And I don't know if you can see on this one, but if you look up at the top, there's a white and a blue bead on one and a red and a white bead on the other. So over the summer, there were so many eggs, pairs of eggs, uh, that the curators use those beads, different colors to track which ones had been laid at different points throughout the summer. Oh, there it goes. That ski is turning around in the egg. Um, and you can see kind of behind there, behind the jar, there's actually a baby skate that hatched out a few weeks before that's in the tank behind it. Um, so the camera is going to zoom in on that and you can really see the underside of the animal. So you can see those gills are moving as it breathes. Its mouth is on the body, the bottom of the body as well. They're a little bit different than stingrays because they have lobed fins on those back pelvic fins there. They don't have a, a venomous bar. They do have some thorny projections on the back of the body. It wouldn't really hurt you unless you, you know, step directly on them in the, the wrong way, I guess, but really cool animals. Um, I don't think our adult, 
our older ones are out and moving around yet in the tank. So Erin, you can play the next video as well, which shows um, once they had hatched out. This is a video that Devin took, which shows some of the ones that were going to get moved to other facilities. Um, so before they got transported, you can see just how many baby, baby skates there were. And as the camera moves from left to right, you'll notice a difference in ages and you might notice a difference in size. So that one in the black tub um, was several weeks older than some of the other tubs. Anything else you'd add there, Devin? Um, Devin, you're muted. So if you wanted to share what you were saying. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, Welcome. And Kayla. Thanks. I was just saying that it was a really fun adventure to r grow out and raise these skates and um, a, a learning process as well. Uh, so we're happy that we were able to share some of these with other colleagues so that they could be used as resources for education. And then um, some of them were also re released and um, and we were trying to play skate Tetris and, and manage all of the little babies. Well, that's wonderful. And I'll keep my eye out to see if any of these adult skates start swimming around in the aquarium. But in the meantime, um, we're going to zoom through a couple of things that you can do as recreational anglers to protect uh, skates, rays, sharks while you're fishing. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Devin to talk more about his research. Uh, but first of all, that top left picture, anyone recognize what species that is? You can put it in the chat box. So anyone that said a clear nose skate would be correct. Anyone know what the bottom, bottom one is? So we looked at this one in the first tank that we were at. So that one is an Atlantic stingray. And then on the upper right-hand side, we didn't see any sharks in our aquarium, but these are two common species that you might be likely to catch if you're fishing in shore. Um, anyone who's been fishing before uh, might recognize them. Anyone know what either the top or the bottom picture are of? I know it's a little hard because there's not scale there. Erin, are we getting any responses? Yeah, a few people said a uh, sand shark. Um, someone said a bonnet head. Um, someone even guessed a hammerhead shark. Yes. So that bottom one is a, um, in the hammerhead genus. It's actually the smallest one in the genus, and it is called a bonnet head. Um, as its common name. And the one on the top is an Atlantic sharp nose shark. Um, so again, ones that you might find when you're fishing. Something cool about the bonnet heads, some recent research has shown that in areas where there's mud flats, they actually influence the behavior of blue crabs, which eat uh, oysters. And oysters are a keystone species around here. So by having the presence of the bonnet heads, it reduces the amount of feeding of the blue crabs on the oysters and actually increases uh, the oyster survival. Um, which is, is pretty good for the ecosystem. It's another benefit of keeping these elasma branks around. Um, so now we are gonna go ahead and, oh, and you were right. Um, the, the scientific name got copied over from the stingray, but Devin just put the, the correct scientific name for Bonnethead in the chat if anyone is, is curious. Um, but we're gonna move on to our next slide quickly um, and just talk about if you are recreationally fishing, um, make sure you have a fishing license. Um, not only is it required by law, but it really that the funds from that go into fish habitat. Um, if you're fishing in Georgia in saltwater, you'll also need a saltwater information permit. This is free, but it just um, lets the Department of Natural Resources know how many people who have fishing licenses are fishing in saltwater. Um, the regulations are there to protect the populations for the future. Um, and some of them have to do with which elasma branks you can keep, which you have to let go in different sizes. It's always good to practice your shark ID. Um, and then to use best practices for catch and release if you are going to be releasing some of them. 
If you are lucky enough to catch one that is tagged, uh, you can report the tags and we'll email out afterwards some of that information about where to report tags and that kind of thing. Uh, but you can actually be part of the research if you do catch one that has a tag. So on the next couple of slides, you'll see some examples of best practices. One is to use non-offset circle hooks. So basically that one that's on the left-hand side is a circle hook compared to the J hook next to it. And the circle hook just catches in the side of the fish's mouth. Um, and so it, it minimizes as much like gut hooking that you might get where the animal swallows the hook. Um, if, if you do have an animal that's gut hooked, the best thing to do is to cut the line as close as you can um, and to use biodegradable hooks um, so that if you do have to do that, it'll break down the animal. Um, on the next slide, you'll see it's also good, especially if you have a larger shark um, or, or organism to hold horizontally to, to protect its body, use wet hands, and then minimize, minimize your handling time. So on the next slide, you can see um, also to leave stingray tails intact. This is a picture of one of our marine education fellows on our RVC dog. And I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but someone had cut the tail before we caught it. Um, and they use that tail to steer when they're swimming and also for defense. Um, and Todd on this next video is going to show you how to handle a live one. The best thing to do is if you are new to angling, to go out with someone who's experienced. <coughs> it is pretty likely if you're fishing inshore in Georgia that you might catch a stingray. So it is really good to know how to handle them. Um, so you can see that he's holding on to the end of the tail there and controlling it. He kind of makes a loop and then pinches with his finger down to control the, the barb. It's about halfway down. You can also de-hook by uh, kind of holding the line vertically off the edge of your boat. Um, and that can also help. And then uh, if, you, if you don't feel comfortable with those, a knotless rubber net can also be really helpful to use. Um, and if you are going to take pictures, it's great to have your camera ready like this woman did during one of our fishing trips. So you can kind of speed up that, that release time. Um, so on our next slide, you can see that there is bycatch in commercial fisheries as well. Um, at least in shrimping in Georgia, uh, the two most common bycatch species are the Atlantic stingray and the Atlantic shark nose shark. So um, those are pretty common, common elasmobranch species. Um, and they do use bycatch reduction devices. Um, and if you're interested in more information about lots of different fisheries, uh, fishwatch.gov is a great, great place to go to make kind of your own informed decisions about different, different fisheries. Um, the other thing is, you know, there's a lot of focus on overfishing and finning, but as you can see on our next slide, um, protecting local habitats is really important for these organisms. In Georgia, we have extensive estuary systems. We actually have about, well, we'll ask you a quick poll. How much salt marsh do you think we have remaining? So on the entire East Coast, what percentage of the remaining salt marsh is found in Georgia? Approximately 5%, 15%, 33%, or 60%? I'll leave that open for just, just a moment. So all of that salt marsh is in the estuary. So where fresh and salt water is mixing and it can be really important habitat for, for elasmobranchs. Wonderful, well, we can go ahead and end the polling and share results. Um, so it seems like a lot of people recognize that we have a lot of salt marsh. Um, so we do have about a third or 33%. Um, we also have live bottom reefs offshore in places like Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. Um, so minimizing, you know, pollution and runoff to these habitats is important. Um, supporting, protecting, and continuing to protect, you know, that, that amazing extensive salt marsh we have is important. Um, on the next slide, you can see some of the different ways that researchers use research to inform management and protection of those habitats. Um, I don't think we have time to click through these, but again, we'll send some links so you can explore a story map of different surveys um, that have been done. Uh, OSEARCH is a, a research team around here that has tagged sharks off the Georgia coast, and you can look in real time and see where they're moving around the world. Um, but Devin is going to talk a little bit more about a specific kind of research in terms of identifying where nursery habitats are and knowing which of those areas to protect. Um, so while he's pulling up his PowerPoint, um, I'll just, while he's doing that, show you this is a, a lemon shark. 
spell. Oh, and it looks like it's just about pulled up. So I'll put away the lemon shark and we can stop spotlighting me. So Devin will um, show up. But this is a species that, that you can find here as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Devin Dumont. All right, thank you, Kayla, very much. Sorry, I didn't mean to pull your teeth out um, or away, so to say. And um, But thank you and thanks to all of our viewers um, that are with us today. I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share some of the research that I did with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources um, for my master's de degree program at Savannah State. Um, now, like Kayla was saying, um, as apex predators, sharks, play critical roles in maintaining healthy and productive and balanced ecosystems in our world ocean. And so it's really important to monitor shark populations uh, for conservation and best management practices. And so before I talk more about research, I do wanna just share some really interesting characteristics. I wanna share some interesting characteristics about sharks and um, their lives. So um, these are just some life history traits of sharks. So, you know, generally speaking, sharks take kind of a long time to become reproductively mature. Uh, I put some examples there of sharks that could be found locally off the Georgia coast uh, with the sandbar shark, you know, averaging about 13 years and the scalloped hammerhead can is really about 10 years for males and 15 years for females. So there are, can also be some variation between um, seas or, you know, like the Gulf of Mexico might have some different life history traits compared to the Atlantic coast. But um, in general, sharks have very long gestation periods. Uh, the spiny dogfish has a gestation period of 24 months. Uh, it's uh, one of, if not the longest gestation period in <laughs> the animal kingdom and in comparison, African elephants have gestation periods of 22 months. So um, it's quite a long time to be carrying that around, I think. Uh, in general, sharks have low fecundity and fecundity just means few offspring or like the number of offspring. So sharks, you know, have, you know, I would say on average about 10 pups per litter for the species that can be found off our coast. Um, and that's compared to other fish or bony fish that spawn millions of eggs in the water column in a single time during a spawning event. Um, most of the sharks that can be found off our coast have a biennial reproductive cycle. So that means that they can only um, reproduce every two years or the females can only become pregnant every other year. And um, I'd like including this fact about how long lived sharks can be. Uh, the Greenland shark currently holds a record for the longest living vertebrate on the planet with a lifespan of over four, or around 400 years. So all of these life history traits actually make sharks more vulnerable to the human impacts of overfishing. Um, however, these life history traits allow researchers to study sub-adult populations in order to understand like what's going on with the adult population. So a couple of the uh, goals of my, my research were to investigate relative abundance and habitat use of sharks along the Georgia coast. Um, Specifically, we're trying to determine what species were there, how many, what the population structure is, and whether or not those any of those species utilize Georgia Georgia's estuaries as a nursery habitat. So if you look at this map and down at the legend on the right, you can see that all of the inshore sampling stations are marked with red dots, and they all occur basically to the west or left of these outwardmost barrier islands along the Georgia coast. Um, you can see a line in between 
barrier islands that delineate sound and ocean uh, boundary. And so those inshore stations were actually part of a larger project headed by the National Marine Fisheries Service called uh, the Cooperative Atlantic States Shark Pupping and Nursery Survey. It's abbreviated to COSPAN. But there are different state agencies that will administer that particular survey and then relay all of the data and information to the National Marine Fisheries Service office. Uh, the offshore sampling stations were all conducted uh, on an annual using annual adult red drum and shark longline survey. And um, you know, together we use utilize both sampling sets to kind of address the questions that we were really interested in and, and trying to figure out our Georgia estuaries nursery habitats. So in order to catch these sharks, um, I mentioned that there were sampling stations, um, but in order to monitor the shark populations, you have to be able to catch them. You have to be able to see what's out there. So at all of those sampling stations, we deployed what is called a bottom set long line. And I apologize for the crude picture, but this is trying to depict uh, a long line with two anchor lines on each end of the main line that hold the long line to the sea floor. There are baited hooks in between the anchor lines or along the main line. And then there are two float lines that go up to uh, buoys resting on the surface. So that's, we use those buoys as markers in order to be able to retrieve the long line after the soak time. So the offshore long line we, you know, was a, a 3,000 foot main line that we deployed off the DNR vessel, uh, the RV Marguerite. Um, every single long line set had 60 uh, hooks and the soak time was standardized at 30 minutes. And, and due to the size and scale of this long line, we had to use a uh, hydraulic winch in order to deploy and retrieve the line. The inshore long line was deployed and retrieved by hand. So that was always really fun because you could definitely feel if you had a fish or, or you know, a shark on the line. And it was very exciting at times, especially when I was almost pulled over into the water by a six foot bull shark um, or a four foot red drum. So that was, I really liked that, just that sense of excitement holding the line and being, trying to pull it in. But for the inshore long line was, it was a little bit shorter at a thousand feet. There were 50 hooks on every long line and the soak time was the same as, uh, same standard to 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, it was time to go to work and get the sharks in. So that was always a fun thing too. Um, and I, I, I like this picture because you can see how that circle hook really kind of it's perfectly designed to go into the corner of the shark's mouth and minimize uh, injury or trauma before being released. So the process of, of getting the sharks or, or getting the information that we needed was always very exciting. Um, once we de-hooked the sharks, we would get all of the biometric information needed. So first we'd identify the species, then determine the gender, take length measurements and weight measurements, um, evaluate the life stage. So what I mean by life stage is we are assessing whether or not each individual was a neonate, a juvenile, or an adult. Now neonates, a, a neonate is just a word that means born within the last couple of weeks or so, and uh, will typically be categorized as juveniles by the end of the uh, season anyways. So all of the tags were, all of the sharks were tagged prior to release and we monitored the release condition and all of this happened within a minute or so for each individual shark. So we, we wanted to get them back into the water as healthy as possible and as quickly as possible. So here are just a few examples of how we would actually measure each individual shark. Um, we had a very large measuring 
table or a board on the measuring table. You can see a bonnet head shark being measured currently with an Atlantic sharp nose on deck. There I am getting the weight of that tiny juvenile Atlantic sharp nose shark. Um, most of the sharks that we caught inshore were of this size. They were not large sharks, um, but still important nonetheless. And these two pictures show the, the tagging process or the kind of tags that we use and which are called roto tags. So on the picture on the left, you can see that I'm, I'm basically using a hole punch to clip a plastic tag to the dorsal fin of a black tip, um, a neonate black tip shark. That, that punch that doesn't cause any pain to the shark and it actually, the tag itself doesn't cause or Im impact the shark's swimming ability whatsoever. And the roto tag has a coded ID number on it and then a phone number on the other side so that if a fisherman or an angler were to catch that individual, they could call a number and report the location and the date and of, that of when they recaptured the shark. And all of that is a huge effort to help researchers and managers and scientists understand sharks movement patterns and range and distribution um, more so. Uh, so these tags are, are slightly different, you know, they're different than what would be called active transmitters, like satellite tags or acoustic tags. They're really just passive um, and don't send any signals, but they do provide the same kind of data that we are looking for in terms of home range, distribution, habitat move, move, uh, use and movement. So I wanted to try to describe how we actually determined which individuals were neonates versus ju juveniles and um, versus adults. So a really interesting fact about most of the sharks found off the Georgia coast is that they basically have an, um, a belly button. Um, they have uh, a placental attachment to the mother, like very similar to mammals, but not exactly the same. And when pups are born, they, they're born live, they will have a scar for a few weeks. And if you look at the picture of the shark, you can see kind of where the umbilical scar would be located on the underside of the shark's body. The category of open without remains and partially healed umbilical scars were used to delineate neonates. The well healed and not non-present scars were used to determine which ones were juveniles. Now, since the larger juveniles and what would be adults, both would not have an umbilical scar, we also had to use a lot of um, uh, literature to determine at what size sharks for the particular species uh, were mature. So here is a laundry list of all of the sharks and or the species that we caught off the Georgia coast for both inshore and offshore sampling locations. And if you look at the very bottom of this table, you can see that we did actually catch more sharks offshore. And if you look at the numbers kind of quickly, you can see that the diversity of sharks was actually higher offshore compared to inshore. But the most abundant species found in both sampling areas was the Atlantic sharp-nosed shark. And some other common reoccurs were the bonnet head, sandbar, black tip, and black nose. Uh, so at this point, I would like to inquire from our audience um, as to whether or not there are any species on this list here that you find pretty interesting or you didn't know could be found off the Georgia coast or maybe you've encountered them before as well, but we'd, I would just like to try to hear from the audience about a species that they really just didn't know could be found off the Georgia coast. So take a few minutes or a couple seconds to type that into the chat box and um, we'll see what, what everyone says. Maybe, um, 
it could be the species or you know, the number of the species, the size, anything that you'd like to share about what you're reading um, from the results of this study. Devin, someone was surprised that there are spinner shark in Georgia. Oh, cool. Yeah, those are so neat. Um, they, they get the name for, for a particular reason. They have a great ability to leap out of the water. And when they are in flying through the air, they will corkscrew in midair somehow and then, you know, crash back down on the waters. It's a behavioral characteristic that's specific to spinner sharks. And it's, it's very, very neat. Um, I mean, I'm not exactly sure what the behavior is supposed to be for, whether it's for like a, a mating or just a hunting behavior, but it is an amazing thing to see when those sharks launch out of the water. Were there any others? Uh, some people are surprised by the number of sharp-nosed sharks. Yes, well, com comparatively, they, I mean, they're, they are quite numerous. And this is one particular species that can reproduce every year. And it, it takes much a much shorter time period for Atlantic sharp-nosed sharks to become reproductively mature compared to other species. So with Atlantic sharp-nosed sharks, you know, we're, we're talking one year, one year plus for them, um, you know, one to two on average for males and females to become mature and able to add to the adult population. And some of the other characters actually on this list are, are the ones that will keep the Atlantic sharp-nosed sharks in check. Um, any other species that anyone would like to share some amazement about? Devin, there was a question um, with the sharks at the bottom of the chart. Uh, mm -hmm. Does this mean that they are born somewhere else and then travel into Georgia waters? That is absolutely correct. So that's a great observation and good for seeing that. Um, so these sharks, if you can... Also look to the right side of the table, you can see those sizes. So 1,981 millimeters, you know, that's almost two meters, which is a large nurse shark, and the, the individual on the very bottom. So that those larger sharks are usually gonna be found offshore in deeper waters. There's still an abundance of food off the Georgia coast because we have very productive coastlines, but, um, it's one thing to know also just like the general size of those species only found offshore. All right, well, those are some fun observations. Um, we're gonna continue on. So this is a, this is a life stage distribution map for the Atlantic sharp-nosed shark. Um, this was a big part of my research, being able to generate maps like this. And sorry, if you look down in the legend, you can see that neonates are depicted by red triangles, juveniles by green X's, and adults by yellow dots. I mean, so, excuse me, blue dots. So. In looking at this distribution map, are there any observations that you know y'all can make? You know, we're asking the audience to sort of type in the chat box whether or not you might be seeing some kind of pattern or something that is very obvious about the distribution of life stages for Atlantic sharp nosed shark. Just take a, a second or two if you want to, to respond. Um, we're going to talk about it. Um, let's give it 10 more seconds. All right, so were there, were there any 
Yeah, so some people said that the younger ones stay closer to the land and the le- there's less neonates out in open water. Um, nurseries are in the March. So yeah, a lot of people are saying the same thing. All right, excellent. Those are good observations. It is um, true that more neonates were, were caught inshore. But if we were looking at also just sort of the general distribution of life stages, we are also finding neonates off the beaches and as far as, you know, seven or eight miles offshore. So we did all, we did run some t- statistical analyses to determine that more neonate sharp sharks were found inshore, but it wasn't strong enough evidence to conclude that this species utilizes Georgia's estuaries as a nursery habitat um, compared to some of the other species that we found. Um, I did want to show a couple graphs about the relative abundance during the sampling season. So if you look at this graph on the left, the y-axis going up and down says frequency, and that's really just like the number of sharks. So we're looking at the number of neonate sharp-nosed sharks that were caught during April, May, June, July, all the way to September. And for neonates, there's a really obvious um, triangle trend showing that the peak in abundance usually occurred somewhere between June and July and then tapered off as we got closer to September. Um, Similar trends were observed with the juveniles and the again, the frequency or the y-axis is a lot higher because there were more sharks caught offshore. But again, we see that sort of seasonal trend, which correlates to water temperatures. Um, these species of sharks that we have here are, are really influenced by water temperatures um, and those more than any other water quality parameter will influence the distribution that they have throughout the entire year. All right, so here is the life stage distribution map for the bonnet head chart. And I would, again, would like to ask the audience to share in the chat box where you see the red triangles. Again, those red triangles that would represent neonates. Take about 10 more seconds. If you'd like to answer. Okay. And Aaron, what kind of responses did we have? Yeah, everyone's saying that the red triangles don't exist and they're not on the map. (laughs) Good job, everyone. You are correct. Um, the bonnet head shark was the, like the second most abundant species overall that we encountered. However, we did not catch a single neonate during this study. So um, we concluded that neonates or neonate bonnet heads utilize some kind of smaller microhabitat within the estuary system that we just couldn't access in order to sample. Um, you know, that could be because of boat size or the gear type used. Um, but, you know, we were able to really conclude with this map and this graph, um, you know, we're able to say that we, we feel like there is a microhabitat within this estuary system where the neonates would be there. So overall, I'm saying yes, that bonnet heads utilize, or assuming that bonnet heads utilize some kind of smaller habitat within Georgia's estuaries as a a smaller sort of micro nursery habitat. Um, What you're looking at, this graph here is called a length frequency distribution. So these numbers along the bottom of the graph are size classes. So sharks that were 400 millimeters up to 500 millimeters. And I, want to draw your attention to the inshore and offshore legend over here. So most 
of, or basically more of the smaller individuals were caught inshore and more of the larger in individuals were caught offshore. So this is again, just sort of a graphical representation of, of our numerical data, the assuming that the, bonnet, the neonate bonnet heads are there, we just, we can't access them or sample them. And as a reference, I wanted to include that a, around 900 millimeters is about three feet. So just to give someone, you know, everyone perspective about how, what size of these bonnet heads are inshore and offshore. All right, so here's our next species, the sandbar shark. Um, could everyone please take a few seconds to look at where we see those red triangles and then, and then type it in the chat box. I feel like everyone's skills are getting better and better at this. All right, so five more seconds. Okay, Aaron, do we have some responses? Yes, we do. We have people saying in the tidal creeks and very close to shore. And someone said that there's interesting, it's interesting that there are no adults on this map. That is very interesting. Um, first, let me say that the other observations were correct. All of the neonates, all of the neonate sandbar sharks were caught inshore. And this is just sort of a, you know, graphical representation and, and conclusion that, yes, sandbar sharks do utilize Georgia estuaries as nursery habitats. Um, you know, the fact that the, the neonates were found exclusively inshore, I think really says it all. And what we're gonna see with our next graph is that the relative abundance of juveniles found offshore increased during October of each sampling year as basically a result of the sandbar sharks migrating out of the estuaries into offshore waters as part of a annual migration pattern. So excellent, well done again, everyone. Um, here you can see that seasonality down here uh, influenced by water temperature um, and water temperature again is a key factor in influencing sandbar sharks to migrate out of the estuaries. Uh, if you look at the juvenile graph over here, you can see that the thick lines representing the free, or abundance or frequency of 2000, 2007 and 2008, both spike upwards from September to October. And again, this is just a graphical representation showing the, that migration pattern out of the estuary. Now, I would like to also go back to your to the other comment, Aaron, and it is interesting that no adult sandbar sharks were found or caught during this study. Um, sandbar, sandbar sharks do take a while, you know, much longer to reach maturity compared to Atlantic sharp nose or bonnet head sharks. And um, they also reach maturity at a much larger size, so more, more close to like two meters and beyond. And so the hook size that we were using during this study could have influenced that. You know, if we had, if our hooks were too small and not able to catch adult sandbar sharks, that would be a sort of gear selectivity or limiting factor in showing that. So the, the adult sandbar sharks could be there. Obviously the adult females are there because they're moving into the estuaries to pup their litters. Um, so they're either not eating when they're doing that or they're not trying to eat our, or, you know, or the, ba the baited long lines that we put out at a time where we're not effective in catching them. So that was a, a great observation that was made. All right, so I'd like to pose one more observational puzzle for our audience here. Um, we're looking at distribution maps between the black tip shark and the black nose shark. Now, one of these species utilizes Georgia's estuaries and beach fronts as nursery, as a nursery habitat, as a primary and secondary nursery habitat. 
So I'd like to, for y'all to take a few minutes to study these maps. Um, and once you have your answer, we are going to start a poll, but we don't want to start the poll just yet because um, then we'll be able to see the, the maps themselves. So this time we're going to take about 15 seconds before we start the poll. And in the poll or in, or in the chat, you, you're going to just be answering which species does in fact use Georgia estuaries as a nursery habitat. All right, I think we can end poll. Excellent job, everyone. Way to go for those of you that answered. You can I can see that you have. You know, it's nice to see that y'all are understanding these distribution maps and how and how they work and what what sort of information they can give to researchers and um, resource managers. Uh, one really really interesting thing to point out about the black nose shark is that it was the second most abundant species caught offshore um, behind the Atlantic sharp nose. And it, it's, I think it's just really interesting that we can see, even though it was the second most abundant species caught in offshore waters, it clearly does not use Georgia's estuaries as nursery habitats. In fact, the only Black nose sharks that were caught within the Georgia, I mean, within the estuary boundaries were actually adults. And when we did some statistics about the sizes, we found that the average size of those few individuals caught inshore was actually larger than the individuals caught offshore. Um, during the entire, then during the offshore survey, two neonate black nose sharks were caught, but they are you know, upwards of five to eight miles offshore. And so it, it does present in and of itself another puzzle. We would assume that we'd be catching more neonates and juveniles somewhere within these areas because of the high number of adults. So it's, now we have sort of another puzzle to, to try to solve. But uh, that, so these, um, distribution maps representing habitat use and you know how we analyze relative abundance of shark of sharks along the Georgia coast it was really you know the most important part of, about the research that I got to do and um, I really do appreciate being able to talk about it and share it and uh, now at this time I'd be happy to entertain any questions anyone might have if you do have some questions please just type them in the chat Awesome. Thanks, Devin. And I know it is after five. So if anyone needs to hop off, uh, we will not be offended at all and, and totally feel free to do that. I will, um, Devin and I will stick around if you do have questions. Um, we're happy to keep answering them for a few minutes. Uh, but for those of you that are hopping off, uh, you will get a survey that will pop up in your browser window. Um, it's completely voluntary, uh, but it's just a post survey that lets us know how effective the lesson was or not. And um, it gives you a chance to tell us what you would keep the same, what you would change. Um, if, again, if you have any questions about the research, you can email me. Um, if you did any drawings, and we're also going to send out an activity sheet afterwards, um, you can, if you want to send that back, we will share any that you are willing to share with us as uh, student sample work in the publication um, if it does get published. So again, if you have questions, you can let me know. And if you have questions for Devin, we'll stay on for a few minutes as well. Okay. All right, so one question is, do you have an estimate of how long the tags stay on the sharks? Well, that's a good question. The, the tags themselves will essentially stay on the sharks unless they're um, knocked off per se because of how the, the tags themselves work. They you know, make a hole punch through the dorsal fin and lock into each other on either side of the dorsal fin. So it's usually, um, they won't come off unless they're somehow knocked off. But, you know, and I can't really assume how that would happen, but um, 
So it is possible, but mo mostly they stay with the sharks for several years. And so that's, it's great because for several years to come, um, anyone who would catch that shark and, and call the number to report recapture information, um, you know, can help for years to come. Awesome. So another question is, are any of the Georgia sharks that you discuss aggressive? Well, I, I wouldn't call them aggressive and I don't know how to best answer that question because, you know, I'm not sure they had as much fun as I did catching them and, and getting them to the boat. But, you know, like I said, that process of catching the shark de-hooking the shark and getting all the biometric information took less than a minute for each shark. And, um, you know, from, from a fisheries standpoint or point of view, we couldn't observe or notice any kind of aggression to what our operations were. Good question. Yeah, if anyone else has any more questions, uh, just drop them in the chat or the Q&A box just so we can get them before we end our program. All right, I got another one for you. Is this research still ongoing? Yes, that's a great question. The, the research is ongoing. So the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Coastal Resource Division continues to run their annual red adult red drum and shark long line survey. Uh, the Coast Span project is also an ongoing multi-state project for the east, eastern coast of the United States. So the Coast Span um, that includes Georgia waters is now being operated out of no North Florida University in Jacksonville. Um, but our Georgia, Georgia DNR um, still sort of assists with the project as needed. Well, thank you so much, uh, Devin, for all of your answers and sharing your really cool research with us. Um, for the sake of time, we are going to go ahead and wrap up the program. But if there's questions we didn't get to, if there's things you're still wondering, um, feel free to email them to us and we can get answers back out to you. Um, in the meantime, oh. So with that, we are going to go ahead and say thank you to Devin. Um, thank you to our friends of the aquarium whose funding help us to do these uh, educational programs. And again, if you have questions, you can find all of that on our website. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon and hopefully get to get out on the water at some point and see some of these animals for yourself or see them again if you've already seen them. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>